Next, I would like to introduce James Suggett, a microbiology and biochemistry junior, who will tell us a little bit more about the research he is involved with on campus. Welcome, James. All right, thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to be talking today about looking at plant enzyme pathways. And so just a heads up, I do biochemistry. I'm going to try to avoid the biochemical jargon and give you guys a high level overview of what I do and why it matters. But first of all, who am I and how did I get here? So my journey to MSU started way back in those ugly days of 2020 and 2021, where I applied and committed to MSU without ever visiting our East Lansing campus, which is always a bit of a leap. But as you can see there, my dog in the Krispy Kreme hat, Chili, and I've been interested in animals for a while. I ride horses. That's me at the World Championships my freshman year. But coming to MSU, I decided to double major in both microbiology and biochemistry and molecular biology slash biotechnology, which really just means I study the science of the very, very small. Outside of the classroom, I'm involved in TEDx MSU, which is our TEDx event that we run annually on campus, as well as being an RA in Phillips Hall. But perhaps most relevant to our discussion today, I do plant biochemistry research with the hamburger lab. And really, we study terpene biosynthesis. And those are two words you might not have heard. Terpenes are the most valuable class of plant biomolecule. So really, if you have perfume, essential oils, have eaten anything flavored, or take a variety of medications, you probably know terpenes. In fact, right, you see the essential oils up there and paclitaxel, which is a chemotherapy derived from a tree, which is a terpenoid. And a note on that nomenclature, I'm going to be saying terpene and terpenoid a lot today. For our purposes, we can think of them basically as synonyms, but they basically refer to what atoms make up those molecules. So terpenes are composed of carbon and hydrogen. They're pretty chemically inactive. They like to hang out, sit around, and generally are fairly stable. Terpenoids have additional functional groups added to a terpene skeleton, which means that they have oxygen and nitrogen and can interact with stuff, right? They can do the chemistry of life. And really, we study the biosynthesis part of that, which is the me metabolic processes that make terpene terpenes and terpenoids. And there are really two pathways in metabolism we think of. There's primary metabolism, which is the stuff if you don't have, you die, right? It's being able to, I know we had some cookies out there, break down glucose. If any of you from biology back in the day remember glycolysis or gluconeogenesis, that's primary metabolism. Secondary metabolism, I like to think is the more interesting one, but I am biased. And that's really how we make and utilize everything else, right? It's making those molecules that we use for defense and signaling, and especially in plants, it's that diversity of compounds that we see that can create everything from some of the world's most powerful chemotherapies to some of the best scents you'll get on a hotel pillow. And so really, how does the Hamburger Lab study this? Well, we use the tools of synthetic biology. And synthetic biology is the idea of programming life, right? We get living things to do something that they don't do naturally. And really, I want to use the example of that machine you see up there on the left. That is ASML's newest, greatest semiconductor manufacturing machine, right? It costs $300 million, fills a room. You have to wear those funny little boiler suits to go near it because if you get any skin on it, it breaks. It's really, really complicated. And what it does is it produces that, right? It puts a couple of hunks of silicon two nanometers apart. And that's really, really cool, right? That makes all of the computers that we use, does all sorts of cool stuff, enables our digital agriculture. But really, it's fairly simple. We're layering metals pretty close to one another. And on the right there, you see a metabolic map. And metabolism 
is a little more complicated. I've heard synthetic biology described as nanotechnology that works. So if you look at that picture right there of our semiconductor, in that same space, you can fit that, and that is ATP synthase. If you're familiar with ATP, you know it's pretty important to life. In fact, ATP synthase, we all have it, we all love it, without it. We do tend to die, which is unfortunate, and it fits in the same 10 nanometer space you see in that picture. And really what you have here is a fascinatingly complex little piece of machinery, right? We have basically the same kind of mechanism we use in hydroelectric dams to generate power, where we have a nice little input for our electrons, we have an axle, and we have our base that implants in our membrane. It's really, really cool. And it's at such a small scale and can be modified so easily. And plants are a great system to do synthetic biology in because of photosynthesis, right? We take air, water, sunlight, and we can make stuff. And really, we can make a whole lot of stuff, right? We can make all kinds of terpenes and terpenoids. We can even make food, which I would argue is pretty great. And the plant that I study is Anona squamosa, and that's known as the sugar apple, also known as the custard apple, has a variety of names. Comes from the fact that the fruit apparently tastes like mint chocolate chip ice cream. I haven't verified that, so take it for what it's worth. But you can see it there on the right. It's kind of a shrub looking thing. Grows really well in tropical areas. So if you're down in Florida, you might see them. Though we do have a few growing naturally in Michigan. And essentially, we're interested in looking at the terpenes. And we have an idea of what the leaf terpenes do. And in fact, the diterpenoids in the leaves have been shown to have antimicrobial activity, which is really, really cool, right? We want to be able to discover new antibiotics. We want to be able to provide better pest resilience to our plants. And so antimicrobial properties are great, but we have no idea what's going on below the surface, right? We have no idea what's happening in the roots. Nobody's studied it. And so really what I've been doing is using this workflow here to analyze what exactly Anona squamosa makes in its roots and how it does that, right? And really this is a simplified overview, but essentially I take my genetic material, I express it in a model plant species using something called transient expression. I analyze the products and figure out what they are. And so now, a bit of pathway background, and I'm gonna keep this very, very simple. We have gibberellin. Gibberellin, it's a plant growth hormone, right? It essentially signals the plant to make more biomass. Cool. Well, the only other fact you're gonna need to know for today, and just keep this in mind as we move forward, is enzymes are generally pretty specific. If you have a background in biochemistry, you'll probably remember that until relatively recently, we thought enzymes were entirely specific. We called it the lock and key model, and it's essentially that an enzyme fits the reaction that it catalyzes really, really specifically. Whereas now we use something called an induced fit model. It's slightly different and has more emphasis on the transition state, but for our purposes, we can think of enzymes as specific to the substrate, which is the starting material that we use in a reaction. And so we can think of it like a toaster, right? I put in my piece of bread, I do one action, right? I press down the little toaster button and I get out toast. And it's the same every time, right? Well, that's pretty much how enzymes work, right? I give them my precursor, I get out a product. Now this is actually representative of a pathway. This right here is ankarine. It's a precursor for gibberellic acid, which is our plant growth hormone here. But enzymes catalyze reactions. Interestingly, we can look at enzyme promiscuity, right? Theoretically, it's possible with living machines that if you put in the same piece of bread, your toast might come out sideways, right? And chemically, what that looks like is instead of getting gibberellic acid, you might get something that looks a little like that, right? And this is how we create the diversity of natural products that we see today because gibberellic acid synthesis is really, really common. Pretty much every plant does it and every plant has the same gene to do it. When we look at a nona squamosa, instead of having just one copy of that gene, it has six or seven, depending on how you classify the genes. And so really to look at those, I use two separate systems, right? We 
do the wet lab work, which is what you think of when you think of biochemistry, right? It's gloves and pipettes, it's lab coats, and sitting in those really white rooms that you see every time you visit a research building with people looking at little machines. And I say biochemistry is pretty much just mixing clear liquids that are mostly water and saying you're doing science. And that's really what I do, right? I take my DNA out of the plant, I, I take my RNA out of the plant, I turn it into usable DNA, I visualize that DNA, figure out exactly what I'm interested in, use polymerase chain reaction, PCR, to do a whole bunch of what we call cloning, which is essentially moving DNA from one larger construct of DNA to another before I transiently express it in Nicothemiana benthemiana, which is basically a tobacco relative. And transient expression simply means I'm not making a GMO crop, right? It means I'm putting a bacteria that is genetically modified into a plant that we have characterized really, really well. It's a model species. So we generally know what's going on with benthi. We then can put in our isolated bacterial system and see what changes. And how we do that is the dry lab, right? The dry lab is the start and the end of my workflow. And so what that is, is that's number one, looking at the genome and the transcriptome, the A's, T's, C's, and G's that make up what a plant actually has to work with, and it's figuring out what we're interested in. Then we go through the wet lab steps and go back to the dry lab to interpret our results, right? And in an ideal world, we get this lovely system where I have one string of A's, T's, C's, and G's that goes to one beautifully characterized product that has a really clean peak. And if you actually see what the Anonis squamosa metabolome looks like, it's a little more complicated, right? But really what we're interested in here is we have Encari, right? That's our precursor that we talked about earlier. And then we have its derivatives, right? Its diterpenoid derivatives that pop out later on. And what that means is it's a little difficult to isolate all of those individually. And because Anonis squamosa isn't a well-studied plant, the information we have to work with is less than perfect. But what we're able to do is characterize the products. And what we find is, much like we foreshadowed earlier, enzymes in Anona are promiscuous. Enzymes are creating multiple products at different levels of oxidation. Essentially, how much oxygen is on our encarine backbone. And this is really exciting because it means we have a mechanism to produce this whole diversity of compounds here, which we're characterizing now. And so really, why does that matter, right? Like, great, James, you've got diterpenoids. Those are cool. Why do I care? And really, we can think of synthetic biology and the work that we're doing in plants as a biotechnological toolbox, right? Something that my lab is interested in that we've studied with sorghum is interactions with the microbiome, which is a buzzword these days, but really means the microbial communities that interact with plants. If you think about where microbes want to live, they love the soil, right? It is usually pretty warm, it is pretty damp, it's musty, right? Everything you think of when you think of bacteria. And terpenoids, and especially diterpenoids, are great regulators of that system. They work really well to influence the composition of those bacteria and what they're doing. So we're able to see kind of cascade effects when plants are stressed or exposed to certain stimuli when they're sending out these signaling molecules to the microbiome. Additionally, we can see right there, right, we're all aware of climate change. I know our theme today is environmental sustainability. And really we can, this refers to what's going to happen in the Midwest with climate change. And really red is bad. There's a lot of red. And so how do we help our plants adapt to that? Because Unlike us, plants kind of have to stay where they are. They can't run away. So they have to learn to deal with things as they come. And really, that's what evolution is. That's why they have so many specialized metabolites. But we don't have a million years until climate change starts affecting our crops. We don't have a million years until it starts affecting our gardens. So we want to provide plants tools to help them adapt to this environment faster. And really, that's how we can do evolution and fast forward. We can target specific genes and specific phenotypes or physical characteristics that we're interested in expressing in our plants, and we're able to do that. My lab is part of the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, 
And a lot of the work that we do revolves around helping create bioenergy crops that are more valuable and more suited to working in a climate resilient environment. And so really a lot of this work comes down to plant protection and improvement. We see there BT corn, which is one of our most famous GMOs. Basically, it protects corn from fungal infection. And if you look right there, this is our BT corn. It looks all lovely and nice, and this is really ugly infected corn. And so what we can do is using these genomic technologies and synthetic biology, target these plants and produce both natural and novel traits that can protect these plants from the impacts of climate change, invasive species, and other stresses they may experience. So really, what's next for me? Well, I've started off in academia, right? I worked with the hamburger lab. I have worked in the MSU iGEM team, which is an undergraduate-led team here that focuses on synthetic biology innovation. And that I've translated that work into industry, working with Bristol-Myers Squibb in patient safety. This summer, I'm headed to Merck to work in their clinical trial data management team. And currently, I'm in the midst of applying to medical school. I'm really interested in translating the wonderful work that we've been doing here and across the country in synthetic biology into patients. And really, this technology is out there already, right? If you've heard of CAR-T, the new cell therapy that takes your own immune cells and targets cancer with them. It's the same technology underlying that that allows us to elucidate what terpenoids are actually doing in plants. And so with that, I'd like to leave a bit of time for questions. So if anybody has any, feel free to come on up. That was really fascinating. So um, it strikes me that the uh, complexity of these terpenoid pathways and the sort of mix and match ability of them is really one of the powers of this system. Um, how do you end up with a plant like Anona as your model or, or, or where, are, what's, the, what's the pipeline for analyzing plant, you know, sort of genomes for being able to get more, you know, kind of mix and matching enzymes that you can use for this? It, I've never heard of that plant before. So the, you know, the fact that you're actually using that is pretty interesting. Yeah, so I'm not a genomicist. I certainly won't claim to be, but a lot of great work goes on in analyzing what genes are being utilized in these plants for these pathways. Something that we were interested in looking at was previous work in my group had shown that the mint family had some really interesting gene clusters to do with how it manufactured terpenoids. And so we were interested in looking at other understudied plants. And so we took a look at Anona and found that really interesting, if I just pop back a sec, that really interesting graph where we saw this clear entcarine peak and then all of these diterpenoids. And we were like, that looks to us like gibberellic acid pathway. We're really interested in figuring out why that is. And I think you spoke really effectively to the modularity of that system. Something that I didn't touch on that is a potential future direction is introducing precursors with different stereochemistry, so a different handedness of the molecule. And what we can do there is potentially create novel products that don't go through the same degradation pathway or might have unique activities in our plant. There's a totally non-science question, but I noticed that you're from New Jersey. And why did you pick MSU? So I'm an alumni distinguished scholar, which meant I got to come here for free, which free is always great. And also I was offered a professorial assistantship through the Honors College, which meant I got funded to do research in a lab for my first two years here, which was a really exciting program and something that really differentiated Michigan State from a lot of the other institutions I was looking at. So it really just felt like the right fit for me in terms of being able to pursue research and doing it at such a well-resourced institution, I know I am continually blown away by the experts and resources we have here at Michigan State, whether, you know, with iGEM visualizing phage with our cryo-EM facility or using some of our groundbreaking fluorescence microscopy to look at expression in plants. It's just incredible to see what we're able to do here and fulfill that land-grant mission.
I'd like to introduce Emily <laughs> Abadwell, a senior zoology and genomics and molecular genetics major, who will tell us a little bit more about the research she is involved with on campus. Thank you for being here, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Emily, not James. Um, <laughs> Um, but I am very honored to be here talking to all of you. I've had a really enriching experience as an undergraduate researcher here at MSU. So I'm excited to share a bit of my story with you all today. So my research takes place in the field of conservation genomics. And if you're unfamiliar with that field, don't worry. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. You're welcome to take notes. Um, this won't be on the exam, though, so <laughs> do what you will. All right, so a little bit about me. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and growing up in a Buckeye family, did not expect to go to school in Michigan. But when I came here, I kept my options open and was just welcomed by a wonderful community. And I knew that Michigan State would be the place where I could have a platform to explore anything I wanted in terms of research, academics, and athletics. So I am right now a senior in the zoology major, and I'm also pursuing a minor in environmental sustainability. Um, I'm also a researcher in Dr. Mariah Meek's conservation genomics lab, and I am also a runner on Michigan State's cross country and track teams and have been part of earning um, the Big Ten championship title as a team two years in a row. Thank you. Okay, so let's explore the concept of biodiversity, which um, Dr. Basso talked a little bit about. Um, so this is a nice little segue. Um, so biodiversity is the variety of all living things on Earth from a genetic to a species to an ecosystem's level. And this variety is important for providing ecosystem services that sustain life on Earth through ecosystem services like pollination, nutrient cycling, water purification, and climate regulation. And so while these are also important for the economy and our culture, I think it is something to be appreciated because it's beautiful and I at least enjoy it. So while biodiversity might sometimes be overlooked, it is essential to maintaining resilient ecosystems and supporting our our well-being. Unfortunately, there are some threats to biodiversity when it comes to rising temperatures and uh, shifting weather patterns and extreme weather events with climate change, the overharvesting of fisheries and other plants and natural resources, and um, things like deforestation, urbanization that lead to the degradation of quality habitats. Um, and contamination of ecosystems. So getting into what conservation genomics actually is um, and um, how it's a, it is a way to study um, the evolutionary histo histories of organisms and explore their genetic variation, ultimately as an avenue for safeguarding this biodiversity from the threats that we just explored. And so by zooming in, on an, organism's, on an organism's genome, we can quantify genetic diversity between populations, assess gene flow dynamics, identify species, and much more. And so these metrics are foundational for designing evidence-based conservation strategies and helping us mitigate threats to biodiversity. So in my particular research, I take a conservation genomic approach to investigate how stream connectivity and culverts impact brook trout populations. So if it's unclear, this is a culvert and that is a brook trout. So um, brook trout are a keystone species and they're also Michigan's state fish. Before this project, I didn't know that Michigan had a state fish, but it is brook trout. Um, so brook trout are renowned for their ecological, economic, and cultural significance. Um, but unfortunately, they've been in decline over the past century due to overfishing, um, rising temperatures, and invasive species. 
And so as they are temperature sensitive and need to disperse upstream for cooler temperatures and spawning, these barriers that prevent their movement can be detrimental to their survival. However, through uh, culvert restoration, um, we can mitigate these threats. So disconnected stream segments have restricted gene flow, which can decrease genetic diversity and potentially lead to inbred populations. And so by restoring this gene flow, we can enhance connectivity and potentially influence this genetic diversity. So this is a culvert before restoration, and this is a culvert after restoration. And so I look at, in my study at a creek called Friedenberg Creek um, in Minnesota. And in 2022, there were three culverts shown here that were restored to be made passable by fish. And so we are looking at how this impacted brook trout on a genetic level by assessing population structure and genetic diversity and ultimately to determine if culvert restoration was an effective strategy for brook trout by enhancing their viability. So based on previous research, I had a couple hypotheses when it came to these questions. Um, with isolated patches, I thought that there would be more population structure present within the stream due to this isolation but after restoration, with fish being allowed to move through different stream segments, there would be an increase in genetic admixture, leading to less population structure and more genetic diversity. And then ultimately that this restoration would be an effective way to enhance brook trout population viability. So to answer these questions, there's just a quick overview of my methods starting with sample collection with collaboration with the Minnesota DNR. Um, these uh, fin tissue samples, non-lethal samples, were sent to me here at Michigan State, and I spent weeks in the lab digesting these tissues and extracting, extracting DNA and preparing them to be sequenced through PCR and other lab techniques. And then this DNA was sequenced, and the sequence data was sent back to us. Spent a lot more time um, learning several bioinformatics tools to filter this data and call SNPs. And SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms or regions in the, D or in the DNA that are variable between individuals and they help us assess for different population genetic metrics. So then I did some further analysis in R and coding. If anybody has ever used R, maybe you can sympathize with me a little bit that it's a little hard to learn for the first time. So I've been, spent, been spending a lot of time on these analyses, and they're still ongoing. But I'll share a few of the preliminary results with you. So when it comes to population structure, based on my analysis, we see actually that there's not much population structure associated with the difference between above and below reaches of the stream, or before and after restoration. So I expected to see some population structure based on where these fish were um, collected, but actually we don't see this. And when it comes to genetic diversity, we see, I expected to see a lower genetic diversity above the culvert barriers due to just it being more disconnected from the rest of the stream that connects to Lake Superior. And we end up seeing this um, in 2021 and 2022, there's slightly lower genetic diversity above the stream. And in 2022, we see actually a decrease in genetic diversity after this restoration, which I was not expecting, but an increase um, in genetic diversity below the barrier. So I will say that these are fresh off of my R script and still need to be tested for um, statistical significance. Um, but there's a mix of expected and unexpected results there. So just to reiterate, we did not see population structure as I expected and genetic diversity may be lower in um, populations above the culverts 
and may increase after culvert restoration, at least in the downstream reaches. But ultimately, science is a process, and more sampling and analysis will continue to see this effect over uh, multiple generations. So although inconclusive at the moment, genomic information from this study will be essential to determining if culvert restoration is an effective management strategy to increase the persistence of brook trout populations in this stream. And stream restoration strategies like this are incredibly expensive and time consuming and require careful planning. So this information will help managers to prioritize projects that will benefit the uh, most, uh, the most, the populations most impacted by these by these barriers, and these strategies help to enhance the biodiversity and stability of freshwater ecosystems in the Great Lakes region, and ultimately supports the valuable ecological services that they provide to us. So, moving on to a bit of my future plans. This spring, I plan to graduate with my bachelor's degree in zoology, and then I'll stick around for another year or so to complete a master's degree in integrative biology. And then I hope to take on a conservation project abroad and then return for a PhD program after gaining some valuable fieldwork experience and ultimately pursue a career in research to continue advancing global conservation efforts. So with that, I would like to say thank you for your attention, and I'd like to open the floor for questions. That was really interesting, and I didn't know anything about conservation genomics before today, so thank you. Um, and that, so that really is the basis of my question. I mean, how, how old is this field, and how, how did you decide to get into this field in particular, because I think that's a pretty interesting choice for you. Yeah, so I have always been extremely interested in wildlife and um, decided to be a vegetarian um, at an extremely young age. I was like 10 years old, um, just because I couldn't imagine, you know, taking away from the biodiversity on this earth. Um, so I've had an interest for a while and always wanted to pursue a career um, in some sort of field that would help protect animals and wildlife. And so I believe that conservation genomics is relatively new compared to a more conservation genetics approach, which is um, which uses something called microsatellites instead of, of sequencing the whole genome of organisms. Um, but I was really lucky to um, reach out to my mentor here, Dr. Mariah Meek, who runs a conservation genomics lab. I reached out to her my, um, at the beginning of my junior year, and I've been working with her ever since and really enjoying the field. So I'd love to continue work in this field, maybe work on mammals, but I am enjoying my work with fisheries right now as well. Yeah, could you use environmental DNA to evaluate the, the fish populations in these streams instead of actually, you know, capturing the animals? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, using environmental DNA or eDNA is another um, method that a lot of conservation um, genomic scientists use. I primarily in this project and in other projects I'm um, part of, we just use uh, fin tissue samples, but environmental DNA is another, um, another option that's maybe less um, invasive or if, you, if it's not as feasible to collect actual species, maybe they're hard to catch or um, whatever the reason is, environmental DNA is another way to get that. 